Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Barry Sinanan. With me at the head table would be Dr. Terence Farrell, Professor Hamid Ghani, who would be our moderator, Mr. Winston Rudder, Mr. Ray Sandy, and Mr. Nizam Mohammed. We are all members of a committee appointed by the Prime Minister, together with Ms. Jacqueline Sampson Miguel, Heyman Reinsing, and Helen Drayton. Those three members, unfortunately, are not with us this evening. On the 25th of January this year, the Prime Minister appointed a committee to formulate terms of reference for a national dialogue on constitutional reform of Trinidad and Tobago. And permit me to read from his letter addressed to me as chairman. You advise that the committee is required to consider and make recommendations to the cabinet within three months of its appointment for the promoting and governing of a convening, sorry, of a national constitutional conference and consultation in June 2024. So at the outset, you see, we have a very short time period. It is probably the shortest period given to any committee to report, and especially on a matter as grave and weighty as constitutional reform. It should be noted that consideration must be given to the diverse nature of the national society, its historical evolution, and the progress made in nationhood since attaining independence, Republican status, and matters related thereto. Further, the National Advisory Committee shall incorporate within its proposed terms of reference outlined parameters of the subject matter for national debate and for the engagement of the widest cross-section of persons and bodies representing the citizenry, including the diaspora, political parties, NGOs, commercial interests, religious interests, labor and trade union interests, educators and students, with a view to promoting meaningful consultations, debate and engagement in the offering and exchange of opinions and the making of recommendations for constitutional reform for Trinidad and Tobago. The committee will be required to initiate, consult widely and guide a national debate towards the generation of a package of ideas and opinions which will be distilled into a working document which will become the working document for the Constitutional Constitution Conference to be held in June. So it is clear that this committee is not mandated to write or draft a constitution. What we are mandated to do is to obtain the views and opinions of the widest general public in Trinidad and Tobago and in the diaspora. For your information, uh, correspondence was sent to our various high commissions and missions abroad, diplomatic missions, and inviting those commissions to inform the diaspora of our exercise and to receive their contributions. I'm happy to see uh, a crowd which I'm told will be growing shortly because, simply because of the, of the weather. I urge you to let your views be heard. This exercise is about you, you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It is you that will shape our terms of reference to offer the government. And it is for the government then to take it from there in a national consultation, get all the views from the widest public in Trinidad and Tobago, and then hopefully come up with a draft constitution. So I invite you to relax. I want to welcome all of you here this evening. 
and please make your contributions. Thank you very much. I will now, <coughs> I will now ask Dr. Farrell to give you an overview of, of what we are about. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, so essentially, the, the approach that we have taken to this exercise uh, in, involves uh, three elements, three critical elements. Uh, the first is that we have taken advantage, or we are taking advantage, of modern technology. Uh, the, the Wooding Commission which reported in 1974, and which led to the 1976 constitution, which is our current constitution, were operating in a world in the Trinidad and Tobago where there was no internet, there was no email, or any such thing. We have that advantage today. And so therefore, we are making use as a committee of email, of social media, to reach the public in Trinidad and Tobago, and to reach the diaspora as well. So we have invited, through those means, we've invited through Facebook, through Instagram, uh, we've invited the population to send in their email contributions to us. And I could report to you today that as of, of today, as of today, I think, we have we've had received over 125 email submissions from the public. The second uh, approach that we are taking is that we are inviting and uh, a number of experts uh, to, to speak with us on specific issues related to the, to the Constitution. Uh, some of these people are lawyers. Uh, some of them are academics. Some of them are uh, people like psychologists um, and, 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 and social scientists because we want to be able to get an understanding of the values of the society we want to understand how those values have changed since the 1976 Constitution. It's 50 years ago that we had the last Constitution. We've had a couple of amendments between there, but basically the Constitution that we have is from 1976. And the third approach are these consultations directly with the population. So we have arranged for during the course of April and into early May, these meetings all over the country, including two in Tobago, in which we want to hear directly from you speaking to us about your concerns, about your issues, and about your recommendations for reform. Our approach then is to distill all of that information, all of those suggestions that we are getting, and we are getting some really very, very rich submissions coming to us from email, and we hope that tonight we will get equally rich uh, submissions coming from you all here uh, this evening that will inform us about uh, uh, what, what, what sets of recommendations the population would like to see. I should also point out that this is the fifth committee or commission that is attempting to do constitutional reform since 1976, the fifth. The Wooding Commission <clears throat> made a number of recommendations. Uh, unfortunately, many of the recommendations made by the Wooding Commission were not accepted <clears throat> by the Eric Williams government at that time. But many of those recommendations remain very interesting, very valuable. Uh, in 1988, the NAR administration had the Higher Tally Commission. And they too began to work on questions of constitutional reform. That effort, which involved our friend here, um, Professor Ghani, uh, was interrupted essentially by the 1990 attempted coup. And so therefore, nothing came of that effort. The, the, uh, the, the Pande administration did not have a constitutional reform committee, but the Pande administration introduced some significant pieces of legislation with constitutional implications, including the Freedom of Information Act, the Judicial Review Act, and the Integrity in Public Life Act. Those are very important because they do have and they relate to important issues 
in the Constitution. And then very interestingly, in around 2006, a group of businessmen attempted to draft a constitution for Trinidad and Tobago. This was called the Principles of Fairness Committee. And again, our friend uh, Professor Ghani was involved in that particular effort. They actually drafted a, a, a constitution. Uh, then the Manning administration uh, asked Sir Ellis Clark to draft a constitution as well. So this was done in 2009. And then in 2013, the UNC People's Partnership Administration had a committee led by Prakash Ramada, which also made recommendation for constitutional reform and introduced a constitutional amendment bill into parliament, which unfortunately lapsed in 2015. So this is the fifth time that the country is attempting constitutional reform. And I know that some people may be very cynical about it, some people may be skeptical about it, but the way in which I look at it, and I think the way in which our committee looks at it, is that all of these different attempts at reform are telling us that people want to change in the Constitution, that we need to change the institutions in our Constitution, that they are not working very well. And I, I, I often invite people, I say, you pick an institution and tell me which institution is working well. And so therefore, constitutional reform is clearly necessary. It is needed. It, people want it. So on this occasion, we feel that we can get the exercise done in fairly short order, partly because we have the benefit of all those previous uh, efforts that were made since the Wooding Commission in 1974. Uh, we have the benefit of technology today to be able to reach a wide cross-section of people through email, through social media, as well as reaching people here in these public consultations. So we, we are looking forward to what you have to say this evening. Our job as the committee is to listen, and we, that's, that's pretty much what we intend to do. If there are aspects of the Constitution that you want to have explained, well, then we can try and explain those to you as well. So uh, with that, let me turn it over to Professor Ghani, who is our moderator for this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farrell. Uh, Chairman of the committee, Mr. Barry Sinanan, Dr. Terence Farrell, Mr. Winston Rudder, Mr. Ray Sandy, Mr. Nizam Mohammed, uh, all members on the head table. Uh, Welcome to the public consultations of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform. My name is Hamid Ghani, and I shall be moderating some of these public consultations being hosted by the NACCR. Before we begin, I would like to offer some guidelines for how we shall proceed. Uh, individuals who are coming forward to offer their recommendations for constitutional reform will have up to five minutes to present their proposals. Participants are asked to be respectful of all views expressed here and all persons in attendance here. If there is available time, anyone who spoke earlier this evening may come back if they would like to express a supplemental proposal for constitutional reform. The session is being recorded to facilitate the Secretariat to compile all of the proposals advanced here tonight. I would ask that you give your name and your general area of residence so that your points of view can be properly assigned to you. I look forward to having a successful engagement this evening, and I would like to invite persons who catch my eye and I will signal to you to come forward to the microphone to make your proposal. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to begin this evening's proceedings. And there should be a microphone uh, making its way around, yes. And if there's anyone who wants to get us started, please indicate and the microphone will be brought to you. So the floor is now open for proposals to be advanced to the committee. Anyone? 
wants to get us started. Yes, we have a, a hand here. Good night. You are talking too hard. <laughs> Good night, everyone. The head table. Um, I don't know all the members here, so I'm not calling anybody name. I know some are not calling them. My name is Solomon Aguilera. I'm from Valencia. Um, to be honest, I didn't do plenty reading of the Constitution before I come here to try and figure out which of these that you know we need changing. But term for Prime Minister, I know they will have it there already. Two terms. President. Our president should be elected by the people. How will you form it? I'm not sure. But it should be put to a vote. Most of the time we believe we, I am talking about myself as a person who is not in the government, believe that um, is friend, friend thing. If we select a president by election, I feel it might be better off. How we do it? I'm not sure. Um, date for election should be not in the back pocket of anybody. If the 16th of January is the election, is the 16th of January five years from now, or whenever it is to be called, let us get ready for that 16th or that date, not when I feel after three months. And, no, if it's three months, say the three months, and we put it, we had to do something about it. Not in the back pocket of people. Um, stipend for village councils. We have village councils who may want to act, may want to do, but this voluntary thing ain't working. We're not getting the best out of the village council. They somehow monitor them, somehow figure out how they're getting the money, if they're working, they're not working. If we as the people could get them out, how we can get them out if they're not doing their job. But we need to do something like that. And, um, well, for now, I'll save two minutes for the next time. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Aguilera. Um, any other persons in the audience who would like to express a view? Good evening. Good evening. I didn't come here to talk really, but there's been something pressing on my mind. I do not know if could, this could, is the right forum. Get your name. Uh, David Brown from Valencia. Right. Um, from, I, I work at a certain place where we have challenges treating with individuals with minor criminal convictions. And um, the decision is that of that particular employer to determine which individuals will be considered for employment or not. I am of the view that we need to do more to reduce recidivism by providing opportunities for categories of criminal offenses for which people want to be given an opportunity to be employed. Um, yeah, just today there was somebody with hanging clothes over a wall, $75, setting up a stall, $150, selling at the stall, $50, fine, $75, fine. And that person has three criminal convictions under the Summary Offenses Act. And that person is challenged to be employed for some very, very minor infractions. So I am urging the committee to consider, I am not setting the tier or recommending a tier or what level, that we find a way to constitutionally give um, first offenders or minor offenders an opportunity to redeem themselves. 
as opposed to just being allowed to struggle along the way, something that they can claim as of a right if they want to change their lifestyle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other uh, expressions, points of view? Yes, the microphone is coming to you. Yes. Good night to the air table. Good night, everyone. Hosted Ted from the Toure area. My concern is that within the constitution, our constitution, there are many laws that are not being enforced. We hear, it, we hear about the laws by the way. All right? You know, something happened and... This is a law, right? And I believe that the Constitution should be made known to secondary school students from as early as Form 1. That's what I have for now. Thank you. Thank good evening to all the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago and also to the head table. Thank God for such a wonderful country that we have freedom of expression. I would like to advance some things here for our constitution because I'm very could concerned. We, could we get the name? Name, name is Johnny Musgrave. And um, I live at um, Northeastern Settlement, San Grande. So I'm going to just read out quickly what I have here. Each home should have a, con a copy of the new constitution. Make it law. Two, there should be basic teaching on the major principles of the constitution, at least in secondary schools. I think somebody said that. Number three, Laws should be made to hold parents more accountable for the unnecessary and absenteeism or neglect of their children. Four, laws should be made to deal with children that stray between school and home. Five, the Equal Opportunity Act, Clause 7, needs to be adjusted. It is not democratic in all application. A person should be able to speak their mind for or against any religion in their home, on their street, or in their personal public meeting, etc. Bearing in mind to stay away from doing such in certain proximity to temples, mosques, and churches, etc. Lawmen such as police officers, judges, lawyers, etc., justice of the peace, should receive severe penalties for encouraging crime. There needs to be more control on the kind of music, not the style, the kind of music played in public vehicles that is vulgar, especially where young people and children are concerned. Another one here, any group that partakes in an attempted coup should not have security companies that uses firearms and should be banned from places where government ministers gather, such as parliament. We need to reverse the laws that allow marijuana or drugs to be in the home because the home described the nation. We need to reverse the law that allow marijuana or drugs to be legal at home, put it somewhere else. Let's see if I have anything else. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other views? Any other views to be expressed? Yes. That's good afternoon. I am uh, Tony Torres from Trainline, Guayco, Sandy Grandi. I am also here representing a uh, association Toko Taxis and Maxis Association, working from San Grande to Matlot. And I, I want to touch on a few issues and uh, some concerns with a couple of recommendations for other stuff. First, I want to deal with insurance companies' issues. With insurance, we've been having issues where uh, in being involved in an accident, for example, fully comprehensive, sometimes the insurance company doesn't fall, fall on their part or their promise of fully comprehensive. And I think that's an issue that the government probably could get involved in and, and make sure that insurance companies do what they're supposed to do. Uh, third party insurance. Third party insurance seem like a bit of a scheme. Even the, the fully comprehensive, but more so third party as a bit of a scheme just to be able to make money on people. Whereas when there is an accident involved in the event, let's say, the person who caused the accident sometimes, if they don't accept liability, in a lot of cases, they, they get away free without being held accountable for their actions. This is an issue that needs to be dealt with in a particular way that would, would give the driver who suffered the situation or loss financially or physically some redress. And I think in this regard, in the event that somebody dies, then serious uh, The insurance would probably meet the individual, the family's individual, because somebody dies. But why does somebody have to die for the driver who suffered the inconvenience of the accident to have redress? And that's unfair. All right. Next. From the association and on a wider spectrum, white buses. I too had a white bus and I started to do my thing. And I remember playing a lot of hide and seek with the enforcers. Apparently that time the enforcers were enforcing. And because of the enforcing, I quickly realized or learned that it's not sustainable to, to drive a white bus with regards, of, with, with regards to the disadvantages I've given my passengers and myself regards to having peace in the law. So now, it will seem to me that the enforcers are not enforcing. And how has it become okay with enforcers and a lot of citizens to now have white buses operating around the country, not just in my area, but around the country, without being held accountable for what they're doing? Now, being a maxi taxi driver now, I had an experience yesterday, when um, Sunday, sorry, where there were licensed officers working in the Maracas area. And they give a thorough check on the vehicles that came down. But that was just one day on a holiday. What about every day when this is occurring? 
where white buses operate in and around cities, Port of Spain, Sandy Grande, Arima, San Fernando, wherever. But there are some areas where taxis or maxi taxis don't facilitate different communities and the white buses actually fill that gap. But what about doing something to give the white buses uh, legitimacy that they can operate in that capacity? Because for all the maxi taxi drivers and all the taxi drivers who go through all the different avenues to secure taxi badge, to get insurance, to get a legitimate taxi, how is it now that we have to compete with an entity that is not authorized to do such? And sometimes we are disadvantaged in obtaining these passengers either on the road or at the taxi stand. Another concern that the, the, the association would have, when developers are developing alongside countryside roads or city side roads, I don't know who's responsible or who should be responsible, or if there's anybody that actually is responsible, that a lot of material is partially blocking roads that cause a lot of traffic, sometimes accidents, police vehicles passing, ministry vehicles passing, and it's almost like it's being unnoticed or okay to be done. Now, this has been causing a lot of issues for a lot of drivers all over the island where you have debris in the road. Okay, from road, road developers, <coughs> uh, property you're, developers, sorry. You're coming up on your five minutes, huh? so just... Okay. Well, you stop me when I have to. And yeah. then maybe later on I can come so back again. Just, just make a last point and then we can move on. Okay. One more thing. Food vendors alongside the roads. Food vendors should be um, made to provide parking at a certain amount of parking for their customers. This too is an issue on the roadways where a lot of unnecessary traffic is created. Um, for taxi drivers, it's very inconvenient since I have to stand for a very long time waiting to get past on the roadway. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other views to be expressed? <clears throat> Hi, good night to the head table. Um, good night to everyone. My name is Brian Ali from the Guayco area. Um, one of my points, I may have many, but this is just the one that comes to mind, is the use of obscene language in public. I think that the, this law needs to be changed and not to be used by the police as a tool to arrest people. Obscene language is, you can hear from the smallest child with use of technology, now it's on your phone, you go to the theaters, it's in the movie, it's in the, it's in the music, right? Um, sometimes people's emotions run high, and I mean, it's basically part of our culture, right? It's, it's nothing amazing that you hear the words down. You can hear it from the smallest kids go up. I mean, I'm not, it's not something that I tolerate, what I would accept, because I mean, it all leads back to parenting. But I think this law needs to be changed because I don't want to see it being used by the police just as a tool to arrest people. Thank you. Thank you. Any other views? Good yes. night. Um, just to add to the conversation, my name is Andy West, and I'm actually from Rio Claro. Um, so two things that I think that could be changed with the Constitution. So a lot of times we hear the president of our country being criticized for not doing much as uh, the head of state. So I feel as though we could probably amend it to allow the president to have more powers because most times she only acts on the advice of the prime minister um, and the opposition leader. And the second thing I would say is the savings law clause, um, which was 
introduced into our constitution to ensure that there was a seamless transition um, when our constitution and when we um, will become in a state, essentially. Um, and to me, it has crippled the development of our laws in more ways than one. So we could probably, I feel like if the transitional period has not come to an end, I should probably move towards removing the savings law clause from our constitution. So those are the two recommendations that I have um, in relation to constitutional reform. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other views? Yes, in front here. Hi, good night, everybody. My name is Elvin Kujo. I am from Sangri I'm from Sangri Grandi. I'm also here representing the Sangri Grandi Chamber of Commerce. Um, just a quick point, really. Um, it has to do with the, the Public um, Service Commissions. Uh, you all can hear me, right? The Public Service Commissions. Now, I don't have a solution for the problem, but the problem is obvious in that it's not working the way that it's supposed to work. Um, Promotions, workers are not being promoted uh, in a timely manner. Um, vacancies are not being filled. Um, persons are going on vacation and the vacancies are being left open to temporary staff. That's an issue. So the, the structure is there, but it, the Constitution needs to be amended so that the, the Service Commission works the way it's intended to work. Somewhere along the line, it's not working for us. Good night. My name is Indra Sinanan Uja Maraj, and I also represent the Sani Grandi Chamber of Commerce. And to just add one more note to my colleague here, maybe, maybe an example can be made when the RHAs were established. I think everybody knows that Sani Grandi ERH is, I mean, we have our challenges, but I speak also from the fact that I was a former board member and chairman of the HR committee. And God help us, if we did not have that act, we would not have enough doctors and nurses. But because the RHAs were given their own power apart from the commissions. It is why today we could stand proud about the service in the area. And maybe the constitu with the constitution, the commissions can revisit how they work and what is working for the RHS, which is a perfect example in the country. We hear about the union challenging, uh, we know, that there are lots of commissions in the country. We have the police, we have, we have several. How many really working? And this is where the public servants will get blamed. But it's the commission who really, as they would say, hold in the pot by the handle, and it's, they dance to the tune. So maybe that's something, you know. But just a quick note on my three minutes left. There are so many contributions would be coming from across the country. But one that I would like to, two that I would like to pick on now is the recognition for senior citizens and physically challenged. You travel, you go any other part of the, let's say first world, and you're going through a door, be it the mall or restaurant, and a physically challenged person is 10 feet away. You have to step back 12 feet. They are first in line. The same thing is with people with children or senior citizens. Why we know that under the building and code uh, for construction of, of commercial buildings, and I think they're enforcing it now, you must have a ramp. How much of it is really being enforced? Who is checking? Where are the banks? having a washroom facility. We look at the pensioners outside the bank and they are lining up. Yes, some have deposits to their account, but what about the majority of them? So senior citizens in this country have toiled the soil for the next generation. 
and they need to be recognized by giving some sort of privilege, simply recognition and first call. Anything you're doing, senior citizen, first call. Maybe some of you might benefit before us, but you all are younger, so we may, <laughs> we may reach there before you. The other one is uh, with respect to the, let me just get, pull it up. Dual citizenship. Why are we allowing our, our people to go abroad in diplomatic offices with that? And yet, you cannot get to enter the political arena with dual citizenship. Maybe this is something. There are genuine people who parents, I mean, you guys would have known the history of the, the brain drain in the 60s and the 70s from this country, most of it to Canada, right? And they would have filed for their children after a period. But for some reason or the other, they came back to Trinidad. They have their citizenship, and they have kids now. And everybody knows that once you have a dual citizenship, it's more about the benefits. Why are we depriving these young, bright people or mature people of serving in office? There are people who are challenged and they also have that dual citizenship, but they can still function. So just on those two points, and I, there are many more which I would leave for other people. Senior citizen, citizenship, and of course, commissions. Are they really working for us? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any other points of view? Pleasant good evening to one and all. Chairman of the committee, other members of the head table, my fellow members of council, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, my name is Alderman David Gadar of the San Grande Regional Corporation, resident of Valencia. Um, my concerns this evening, as it relates to the Constitution, has to do with independent senators. The roles and functions of independent senators in relation to the needs of the general public to have access to them to probably raise issues on their behalf. Uh, members of the public who, for one reason or the other, are reluctant to go to any political office, for that matter, that is parliamentary offices, what are the possibilities, or in fact, I'm suggesting that the independent senators be allowed to have a day or whatever to accommodate the public to take their concerns and raise it at the parliament. So the, the, the general public could have a voice in the parliament outside of the parliamentarians. Um, secondly, policing. On many occasions we hear at the courts of officers, police officers, making arrests, and at the end of the day, you hear the judgment coming down against the police, and individuals are awarded thousands, if not millions of dollars in compensation. It is high time that these officers be made to pay their way, and not the general public through uh, our taxations and so where the, the, the government will have to pay these individuals for wrongful arrest because on many occasions you hear that coming from judgments handed down by the courts of Trinidad and Tobago. And thirdly, parliamentary privileges. It is my humble opinion that parliamentary privilege be dispensed with, if not in whole, in part, in the sense that where the general, the public is concerned, when members are maligned in the, in the parliament, they have no redress. It is high time that members of the public be allowed some kind of say 
in having redress when they are maligned at the parliament. Thank you. Any other uh, points of view? Yes, we have, we have one there and then one here. Um, good night again. I'll try and take my two minutes this time and finish it off. Um, we, we, our culture in Trinidad is to drink anyway. Drink by the bar, drink by the river, drink, 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 anyway, anytime, anyhow. It's time we start covering with drinks when we want to drink it. We need so much times we, we look at things from other countries that seems to work for them. And we don't want to take part in that. We just want to continue doing what we want in Trinidad. I think we should do something in terms of drinking exposed. See what the American Constitution have about that particular thing. Um, I don't know what it is. I was there, but I don't know what it really is. Banks. Banks make millions of dollars on, on, from our money. And somehow we don't get fair dealing from them. A bank would withdraw your money for a penalty or for some basic tax. They're saving your money and they're taking $25 a, a month and so on. But they don't even put back part of that. When you catch yourself, your account dry. They don't even inform you that your account going to close. Nothing. They just take every cent. Time for us to check them and see. We need to find out why do they take all this set of money, why they're making so much of profit on our head, and we don't really benefit from it. I showed how people, if they could, they never put money in the bank. Well, we just had to do it because when we got a check, we had to change it. Um, I know we have an issue with hanging in Trinidad. Either the hangman is working, I don't know if he's getting pay. But um, I think because of the pattern, Morgan, we have restrictions. But I think we stay too long to push that to make our work easier. People on the outside fed up with the foolishness. We just can't take the law into our own hands. But I think we need to do some structure around that where we either time frame, time frame. We have too much of people just sit down on their laurels and time running out and they just don't care. In every district, like Sunny Grande, maybe Arima and so on, we should bring a youth camp or a training school, not necessary white tip and so on. Youth camp like it used to, like Presto Presto and the others like Tobago Farm School and so on. We need, to, we need to do something for our youths. Um, buses with children, loading and offloading. We shouldn't be just overtaking them. We should respect them. Children could get knocked down. It may have happened already. I have grandchildren going to school that travels in bus. Not PTSC bus, private buses. And you always have to be one dying. If them children just cross the road. My father always used to say, a child is like a, a, a goat. They just, just run. So we always have to look out for them. Um, well, again, time frame for the public servants. You have an application for a lease, agricultural lands. My mother has died a good few years now. And since in 1999, she applied for her new for her lease. No way you're again. It and so many people could sing that same song. You don't care what document you're carrying. They always have something. They're never doing their job. We need to try and find some time frame for things that are supposed to be done for the public. Sometimes we, I as a farmer, will feel better. I do go down to the Ministry of Agriculture and forget them people and them. And I know I'm not the only one. Because they drag the foot, the mama guy, they play games. I don't know how we could put it in the Constitution to make sure they work. 
But um, the other child, I think I'll just take my two minutes. Thanks. Thank you. There was someone who had their hand up at the back. Uh, yes. <laughs> Good night, everyone. My name is Nina Lorraine Khan, and I'm from Guayco, Sangre Grande. Um, I came in a bit late, so I don't know if this was raised before. But my contribution is, I think it's high time that we make the Caribbean Court of Justice our final court of appeal. <laughs> so that's basically my contribution. Thanks. Pleasant good night to the head table, members of council, members of the various groups. The name is Paul Monglas, former councillor, now Alderman at the Sangre Grande Regional Corporation. And let me firstly thank you and welcome you to Sangre Grande, coming here first to uh, hear our views, which will set the tone for the rest of the country. And let me also take the opportunity to thank the Prime Minister and his infinite wisdom for putting this committee together for us to move forward. Um, there's two suggestions I have. Firstly, I would like to advocate, well, as a local government practitioner, for the inclusion of local government into the Constitution, because I know it is not formally there this time. And seeing that we are moving towards reform of local government, I'm asking that we place it in the Constitution. And the second suggestion, um, it was stated earlier on in the advent of social media, how we advertise for this event, seeing that social media is part and part of the entire world now that we include social media as part of our constitution and the proper management of social media, the usage of it, so that we'll have a positive use of social media to benefit our country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other points of view? I thank you, David Brown, Valencia. Um, we appoint a president, and then everything the president done, does is on the advice of the prime minister. I think it's time for an executive president. We, we really fooling ourselves with this. Um, we, we've moved away from the system. We are republic. I would like to see an executive executive president, so that some election down the road, president so-and-so, with all the powers, as opposed to the ceremonious thing going around in a circle. Thank you. Thank you. Any other views? Uh, pleasant good night, everyone, to the panel. Thank you for being here. We appreciate this opportunity that we are being afforded to state our views um, with regards to constitutional reform. My name is Yenzi Bernard. Um, one of the things I wanted to speak about is basically with regards to religious provisions in this country. I believe the government should separate itself from the various religious organizations and in fact, the taxpayers' money not involving each and every um, taxpayer in the various religious denominations. Even though we appreciate and we pride ourselves as a nation that is, that is diverse in religious and cultures and these things, the government should separate itself from various religious um, ceremonies or from being a part itself of the religious um, ceremonies, right? Like, the various religions should be able to do their thing privately without the government having to be involved in it. So the government will be separated itself from the various religious institutions, thereby taking away a lot of the idols 
They should not have the idols in public platforms, but whoever religion, they, they're free to worship whatever they choose to worship, but it should be done privately without the government being involved in it. And two, my other point is basically on the domestic violence, right? Because the domestic violence acts heavily against men, I should say, right? And the family is the backbone of society. And we need to do something more to promote higher family values, right? So the men, husbands, fathers need to get better rights in this society because at present, the way the laws are structured, men bear the brunt of the of problems when it comes to divorce, separation, the upbringing of the children. Many studies have shown that um, children are suffering or do not develop properly as a result of the lack of the father in the household, right? So one of the things that needs to be done is a bigger emphasis on family values and to promote positive marriages. They should, they should um, be promoting the marital home and doing more things to sustain the family, right? To keep families together. The constitution should be more focused on the child, the family, keeping the family together instead of just separating, causing separations in the family. So the children will be able to develop in a much better way, having a better family-oriented background, right? So which would keep them away from a lot of crime, drug use, and um, societal ills, right? So this is just two of the things I'd like to speak about at this time that I'd like to bring up. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other views? Good night, everyone. Good night at the table. All right. I have four major points with regards to... You get the name, please. My name, sorry, my apologies. My name is Dave Passad. I'm a resident of the district, right on this road. Okay. okay, so with regards to constitutional reform, and we're looking at certain issues, four pertinent points here. First one, significant disparity in the allocation of resources, right? The current situation exists where there's significant disparity in the allocation of resources between different regions, despite similar population sizes. Let us look at some of the, the challenges that this equation brings about. Inequality and disparity, marginalization and discontent, underdevelopment, political tensions. To address these challenges and achieve a more equitable distribution of resources, constitutional reform could consider several approaches to decentralize and distribution of funds. Fiscal decentralization. Devolve greater fiscal powers to regional and local bodies, allowing them to collect and manage their own revenues through taxation fees and other means. This will enable the regions to have more control over their finances and tailor spending priorities to local needs. Next point, Equali equalization of mechanisms. Implement equalization mechanisms to redistribute funds from wealthier regions to poorer regions, ensuring that all regions have access to basic levels of resources and services. Point three, needs-based allocation. Develop transparent and objective criteria for allocating funds based on the specific needs and priorities of each region, such as population size, demographic characteristics, socio-economic indicators, infrastructural requirements, and development goals. Empower the regional governments. Strengthen the capacity and autonomy of the regional governments to plan, implement, and monitor development initiatives. Point five, public participation and accountability. Ensure the decision-making processes related to resource allocation are transparent participatory and accountable to local communities. This could involve mechanisms such as public consultations, citizens participation forums, and independent oversight bodies to enhance accountability and prevent corruption. Right. Let us look at the case of the THA. Just in case fellow residents don't know this, 
the San Grande Regional Corporations get about $100 million a year. THA does get $3 billion. That is $30 more allocated there for the same size of population, serving the same size of population. How does a child function with 30 times less resources? All right, let's look at it. All right. What does affords the THA is a greater deal of autonomy, fiscal management, local decision making, community development, accountability and transparency. We don't have that here. All right. Overall, Tobago's THA system exemplifies how decentralization can empower local communities, enhance democratic partic participation, and promote more responsive and effective governments by giving people greater control over the resources and the decision-making processes. Similar approaches for decentralization in other regions of the, countries, of the country could take place. Right. Let us look at decentralized regional security. Decentralization of government services, particularly in the realm of national and regional security, can play a significant role in combating crime and improving overall public safety. Let us look at some of these ways. Local police units. Constitutional reform can empower local government, governments in Trinidad to establish and manage their own local police units. These units could be responsible for law enforcement activities within their respective regions, similar to municipal police, but more resourced. Right? Community policing, we already had this. We need to get this back in place. Quality control measures by the residents. Residents of the districts would have a direct state in the, stake in the quality and effectiveness of their local police services. Constitutional reform would provide mechanisms for residents to provide feedback, raise concerns, and hold local police units accountable for their actions. Voting right for changes. Residents could be granted voting rights to make changes in the police service, including the appointment of senior officers and the implementation of, of crime suppression strategies. Coordination with the national for forces. Right? While local police units would focus on addressing localized crime issues, coordination and collaboration with national security forces remain essential for addressing broader security issues. I'll be short. I just have one, one, one more point here. All right. With this, we will have independent review, review mechanisms, legal, legal safeguards, and due processes, quality control measures by the people of the district regarding the policing services afforded, afforded to them. We don't have that right now. Voting right for changes, local accountability mechanisms, transparent recruitment and appointment processes, community engagement and consultation, performance evaluation and monitoring. Right? Now, we're looking at decentralization of employment. After COVID, we realized that people can work from home, and this could be effective and reduce the, the traffic situation on the roads. Let's look into it. We need to, to have remote work policies to make these things effective. We need to develop the technology infrastructure to get this operational. We need to have flexible working arrangements. This would result in reducing commuting, the square footage on that road that continually occupied. We need to reduce that, the occupancy on that. The improved work-life balance that would, this will afford the people of our community. You know when you go to work here to reach Port of Spain, it's take two and a half hours to to reach and two and a half hours to come back. That's five hours of your living day that could be spent with your children. And it could be de decentralized into offices here. Why not? All right? Now... You're coming close to your five minutes. Yeah, I know. I almost finished here. Constitutional reform and property taxation. Let us look at that. Do we, after we, we're looking at this debacle taking place right now, we have any control over what's going on? My property was valued the same property as the, the, the finance minister's property. In Marval, I live in the lowest, the, the, the area with the lowest human development index in Trinidad and Tobago, but I share the same rental value for my property with the finance minister in Marval. This, this, this sounds logical to me or anybody else. We have no control over these things, right? So we need to have local control over the, the, the taxation rates direct investment in the vicinity and the community by our taxes, not spent outside of the region. This will build our value here. 
enhance local development and prosperity, transparency and accountability, fairness and equity, stimulus for property improvement. Overall, decentralized data of government and constitutional reform can help address issues associated with property taxation by empowering local communities by, and to determine taxation for policies. Guys, I guess that's all I have to say with regards to these things. Okay, thank, thank you. Time. Any other views? Hi, good night, everyone. My name is Selwyn Lal, and I'm a resident from Barbande, Ojo Tandy Grande. Um, well, I'm on the, on the roots side of this whole um, seminar here right now. Um, the thing that is, how should I say, challenging us right now in Sandy Grandi area is crime. That is the number one thing, crime. We could put everything together that have been said here tonight, and the number one thing in Sandy Grandi right now is crime. And the crime is based on a lot of turf war, gang war, and all different type of wars. Um, it is so how shall I say, it is so out of control right now that um, a lot of the young youths are being recruited, are being recruited to be part of this crime that is happening in our community. The young guys are being recruited, so many of them are dropping out of schools, many of them are dropping out of trade, they're dropping out of sports, because the type of influence that they're getting right now, they believe to be a gangster, is the way to go. And this is so sad. And the only time we, 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 we may hear some kind of response to these things is when someone gets gone down. You may hear he was a good boy, or you may hear he was a bad boy. But what it is, what, what, what has really been done, or what it is, it have in place, to avoid these young guys being killed on a regular basis. I can remember when I was growing up, the, 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 um, the things I used to be hearing is that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, in the time that we are living in, it's the gangsters and them who are raising the children. Because when the parents and them leave and they go to their work or wherever, these young people have the freedom to move around and to interact with these people and them, both young boys and girls. Some of the boys might end up on the gangs. Some of them, you see them at the side of the road at the corners, they either they're gambling, they smoking weed, or they conspiring to commit some crime. So I am asking tonight what it is we, we are going to do or what it is we have in place to offer to the youths of them, to, to, to distract them, to deter them from turning into a life of crime. When we look at it, some of these young men are not getting any love from their home. There are a lot of broken homes that they are coming from. So they believe to themselves when they go in these gangs and them, that they have been loved that the, 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 the gang leader have their back and they gravitate to that. Are we putting things in place to, to, to help them direct their energy in, 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 in more positive things, like in sports? I can remember when I was growing up, they used to have, um, in different areas, they used to have football tournaments. And these tournaments used to bring out a lot of young people. And they used to take part in it, and some of them 
when, when people came there and they saw the talent, some of them was, was taken to, to different clubs and so forth. How come these things has just vanished? I can remember on the, in this Toko Road here. I'm not from Toko. I am from Port of Spain. But I can remember it had a nice competition up on that side there. Where the fields and them was well kept. And the young men could have go out and exercise. And kick a ball and do certain things. And they used to have the tournaments now that, that would attract them now. That they believed to themselves by performing good in these tournaments. Something good could have come out of it. I'm not seeing these things. I'm not seeing these things. Our next thing I will bring up is with the police service. Yes, there are hard-working officers, but then there are officers who are corrupt, rogue officers, who are putting pressure on the good officers and them. A lot of these officers, now the good officers, they need some kind of social interaction. Yes, I may, I may hear that they, they, um, you all have a social department in the TTPS, but then tell me how it is it can have a, a department like that, and yet still officers are committing suicide. And all crazy things are happening to them. Why is that happening? Something is definitely wrong. There's a breakdown somewhere. There are some officers, they're not even happy to go to work, but they're just going to work because of whatever reason because something has been broken down in the TTPS. And if we don't have happy, happy officers and officers who are willing to go to work, how would we get the protection that we need in the community? We would not get it. You're coming close to your five minutes. Yes. Sir. Yes, we would not get it. So when we talk in community, it is a holistic effort. And when things are put in place, it's not that... We see you all once a year or once every two years, the same way when election time is coming around, we see you so often. It is a good, it, it is a good thing to do that we can see you a little more often in the community, that these young people will see that you all mean business and you all really interested in them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other? There was someone in front here. Yeah. You had your hand up? Yes. Thank you. Um, pleasant good night, everybody, again, to the head table. It's so nice to be in a country where you could, you could talk. So um, I've been very concerned about the country. Johnny Musgrave is my name, and I, um, I live in Northeastern Settlement. Um, I just jot down a few other things here. I've been observing um, concerning the spraying, when people spray gas, um, grass, the spraying of grass. So sometimes people spray grass, and sometimes you have people could pass the grass and get poisoned. So what I'm saying here is a person spraying their compound should serve notice to the neighbors in close proximity and place a sign on the grass that is sprayed where the public, people pass in the public. Illegal guns. People found with illegal guns or in gangs should not receive bills for some months. That is common sense. So I hope you could use the common sense. Common sense is God sense. Security companies should ensure that their officers are safe. We have a lot of big security company and the way they, companies and the way they place, the position they place the officers in. I don't know. And a lot of good men get killed. Before government sell our resources, such as the Pitch Lake, I'm not too sure on the story with the Pitch Lake, but before the government sell our resources, a referendum should be taken countrywide on such. And clear notice should be given to the public on such. Receipts. Banks and other companies, especially big companies, should give proper receipts that do not fade. It should be an offense for a bank to give people receipts that fade in. 
they, could, they are taking a lot of advantage with that. The National Lottery. The National Lottery, I suggest, should be used to help poor citizens because it's something that is surely is a sure thing. People put money in it. So the National Lottery should be, help, should be used to help poor citizens once the price go over a certain amount. Let's say it goes over $10 million. Instead of giving one man $20 million, over $10 million, the price could, uh, if, it, if it goes to $15 million, $5 million can be taken and divided to help repair poor people's homes. These things will relieve a lot of suffering in the nation. And last of all, there's a need for wardens, plain clothes and otherwise, checking farmers to ensure that they use spray on plants properly. Farmers pick plant, uh, take plants into the public to sell too short after they um, spray them. That is happening. Businesses, Watersons to ensure that businesses give receipt. A lot of businesses not giving receipt. Big businesses. The government is using a lot of money with that. Officers, plain clothes officers in public transport to deal with drive bad. And for instance, you can plant bad driving. You can plant an officer at random in a public vehicle. Well, of course, you'll have to pay the driver. He comes in as normal. But he will be able to deal. So I, I think that if you do things like that, people would know that they are watch. So you may, you may have, you may just have 10 officers in the whole country, but because at random, an officer, a plain coast officer could be in a vehicle, a lot of things could be avoided. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Before I take the next one, I've been advised that um, a member of the media who is here and has come to cover the event, his car broke down and um, is asking if anyone is heading in the Mayaro direction afterwards, whether he could be afforded some kind of assistance to, um, to, to, to get hope. So I'm just mentioning that now so that um, you could consider it in the interim. Uh, anyone else to raise any issues? Let me see, any hands? Any hands? Any hands? Oh, we had you, yeah, but do we have anyone was here? Was someone here? Did you, yeah, okay, I didn't see a hand, so I said, yeah, okay. Pleasant. Good night, everyone. Anicia Williams, Councillor for Valencia East Oak. I want to say a pleasant good night to members of the head table, members of council, and all members of this public gallery. Um, my contribution tonight, I just want to reiterate based on what a member of the public stated, um, consider, considering the mushrooming crime situation, decisions need to be made with regards to the death penalty and the retention of the Privy Council as our final court appeal. Right? Um, and if a decision is made towards abolishment, then the definite and irreversible term of imprisonment need to be made mandatory. That is my suggestion on that terms. And I also want to piggyback on what Mr. Tid has stated earlier on in his contribution concerning uh, making it mandatory for the constitutional reform in schools, so making it mandatory that it's been taught in the schools, right? Um, and also, um, lowering the voters, the voting age to 17 years. Um, I came up with that because of the fact that 17-year-olds um, are eligible to obtain their license. So um, this is my contribution based on that and also 
As the councillor for Valencia is Toko, um, Toko is such a large area. And in order for us to properly administer, for it to be properly well administered, right, the geography of an area should be looked at when forming constituencies and electoral districts, right? So that is my contribution this evening. Thanks. Thank you. Any other? Yes, good night again. Um, what I wanted to mention is really about um, the marijuana and hemp production. We need to look into using these, taking advantage of the business aspect of these things as well, because there are a lot of countries that are profiting off of marijuana and hemp production. And it could also be used to create a lot of jobs and employment. Plus, you need re-education systems in place for people, the youths, to learn the proper usage of marijuana and hemp. Instead of they just learning what they have on television, seeing it being smoked and these things, but our education system to teach them of the other benefits of the herb, right, and how it can be used, utilized to create building materials and other aspects, right? And factories and these things can be developed in certain areas, example, like San Grande, which has a lot of unemployment and these things, places where unemployment is very high, you could build um, factories and take advantage of the hemp production, marijuana production, and to be able to create jobs for a lot of youths, which will also pique their interest because it's marijuana. So I believe that they need to look into the business aspect of marijuana and start to use it to capitalize on making money for the country because it is a cash crop, right? And it will um, also help with crime and unemployment. Right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, at the back, yes. You and then the person at the back. Okay. Again, Solomon Aguilera from Valencia. Um, we have a point system. Um, I don't know how they'll fit that in the constitution or what they could do. But you, it seems like you're getting two bites of the same for the same um, penalty. They charge you for driving and they'll leave you with points. You pay for the driving offense, but they leave you still with the points. Is it that they want to take your license from you? Is it that you want to take privilege from people? I don't know. I, somehow I find it have a, a, a sting in the tail of that. Um, guns. Illegal guns in Trinidad. We, I think we're getting fed up of them. That should be a no-no. Too much people, you hear stories of they get bail on a gun. I feel we should you don't have a gun. You have a gun that you're not supposed to have. The magistrate is supposed to do what they're supposed to do with you. And somehow, like, they, I don't know. I don't know. We, we can't mandate the magistrate do, but I think we could uh, put things in place that says when something like this happens, Your Honor, your job is to do this. That is not a discretion. Your job is to do what is do it's supposed to be done with a person having an illegal gun. You have one, two, three strikes. I think we're supposed to do something about that. You can't be having guns. Tourists coming into Trinidad, leave them alone. You interfere with that tourist, mandate. As long as somebody's a tourist in this country, find some way, somehow, to send a signal to these people. You can't do that. There are things we have to try and put in place that you can't do. It had to be written so that we could challenge if you don't do what the law say, we will deal with the magistrate or whosoever is supposed to do the law. And I don't know how all you'll fit it. That is all your job. Thanks. At the back, yeah. no, to the left, to your left. Yeah. There was someone who had their hand up. Yeah. A pleasant good night to the head table, to each and everyone in the room. A pleasant good night. 
My name is Kemba. I'm from the Dambu Hill area, Sandy Grandi. Tonight, my contribution will be on behalf of the youths of, uh, I want to say, Sandy Grandi and my area. Now, um, when I look at the laws of Trinidad and Tobago, um, everything is 18 years and older. But there are youngsters finishing school, I mean, having their CXE level at age 16, right? And um, they still have to, the parents, some parents cannot afford to still send a child, they don't struggle for them to reach 16 to finish form five, and then they still have to find an next year or two before their child could get a proper job in this country because they have to be 18 years and older. And in some, in other countries where we, pattern like America, it's at age 16. So I think that is one of the things we should look at. 16 year olds being able to vote, being able to work in a proper job because they have their qualifications and not just try to stifle them for the next two years until they reach 18. That's my contribution. Thank you. Not someone over there. Any other? Yeah, in front here. Thank you, dear. Uh, Alderman David Gadar, once again, just an addition to my suggestions earlier that um, national service becomes mandatory. We make national service mandatory in this on our present situation. Thank you. Any other views? Just on a lighter note to let you know that whoever is doing the PR needs to be probably a little more with it, or I want to say, for instance, Sunny Grandi, this was posted two days ago, uh, Point 14 now, who you posted the three venues, they have three days, Dago Martin have five days. Um, one of the things we need to recognize is that Sandy Grandi is on the same level with all of these towns. And we should be given the due respect because I'm quite sure that there are people within this entire region who would have wanted to come out, but two days' notice was a bit too short. So just maybe if you could take that into going into another area so that they don't fall within the same thing that happened there. Right? Thank you. Um, just permit me to remind you of what the moderator had urged uh, members of the audience. If any one of you live in the Mayaro area, Mr. Frontin from, I think it's CNC3, his transport has broken down, and um, we would like to treat the media uh, very well tonight. So any of you living in that area, of the, the Mayaro area, Please check Mr. Frontin, he's in the blue shirt there next to the balloons, and offer him your assistance. Thank you. Any further? Yes. Good night. Sean Mahes. I've Listened, I came late. Can we get I, your name, please? Yes, I've listened and I, I heard the majority of the sentiment from the forum being socioeconomic issues. And I am aware that that plays a limited role in the functioning of what this body has been constituted to do. But we have to... Yeah, could, could we just get the name? Sean Mahes. Hmm? Sean Mahes. 
it, all right? The socioeconomic issues and what is coming about here is as a result of a lack of consultation with the people, a lack of an outlet for people in the community to have their say structurally within the system as it exists. And you can see people have lots of very valid solutions that they would like to speak to power. But unless they are part of the political system and perhaps have some sort of say and influence and they know somebody, that seems to be the only way your voice can be heard. Either you are somebody big or you know somebody who knows somebody. And a good, proper constitutional arrangement that is forward-looking and engages in young people to bring about new ideas and engages with the layman who might have a better solution to his problem than a politician sitting behind the walls of parliament under heavy security would have a means by which people can get their sentiments across to the halls of power. And that, I think, is what is lacking in our system. And that has disenfranchised many people from getting involved. I could tell you, as a young person, many of my peers and the generations below me have no interest in getting involved in anything that will affect change in this country. And I have been observing and been trying to be part of change since I was a teenager, coming to the last set of constitutional reform forums and policy and consultations when they were coming about right here in this Sangri Grandi Civic Center. And I have seen barely anything said in those forums ever reached a policy or a legislative change. And then people get tired and weary and fed up. And their children say, you know what, let me go and study abroad. And then when they go there and they are able to join with other people and sign petitions and get changes done, they feel a sense of empowerment that we don't have here in Trinidad and Tobago. And that is what is lacking in the system, and you could hear it across the board. And people want that for the youth. They want that for the future generations. They want to feel involved in decision making. So how would we affect, how would we get that in a constitutional reform setting? We've talked about it for many years. Referendum. Recall. Getting maybe the politicians to have to listen to the people and come and have their own forums like this more often. So how do we do that? Maybe we, we reduce the terms of the politicians so that instead of five years, they have to come back to us every four years. So after the first year, they have two more years of campaigning before, of doing work before they have to campaign again and come back to us. Maybe three years. That's a little radical, but Five years, I think, is too long. Our politicians get too comfortable. And it's only in the last year before election, all the sweeteners come and all of the goodies and all of the promises, and now they know you by name. They know exactly the drain that needs fixing. They know exactly the issue you had five years ago, and they're telling you now they'll fix it. So we need to have a right during that time that they're on their toes, the MPs, the people elected to serve us, that they feel that at any point in time, if they're not performing, they're not coming to see you, we could call a, ref a recall on your, on your seat. We could even come up with an idea, like some of the nice ideas I heard this evening, and gather 100,000 people and help people feel involved in one cause that could help their community. And if it is 
national service. I've been hearing about it for budget after budget, and I've not seen it implemented. Maybe this and ideas like that, when the people want them enough, and they get 50,000 or, or 25,000 or 100,000 people to mandate EBC to call a referendum, and then there's a movement, then we will start to see the public get involved and the politicians listen and start to be more responsive to not what they want to do on their agendas and the agendas of the people who, who finance them, but the layman on the ground. And I think that is where the, we are lacking in our constitution, and I think that will make the world of difference to the system. Referendum, the power of recall, of course with, with the right safeguards, and perhaps lowering the time between elections. That's one point. The next point is that the minority views here being discussed are, are, are clearly not making their ways into parliament. And time and time again, we see people showing an interest in electoral politics, and because they're too small and their votes are not enough, that's it for them. We need to find a way to have minority voices, whether it be special interest groups or smaller political parties, start to have a say in parliament and not feel disenfranchised if they get 10,000 votes. You know how many votes 10,000 votes is? Or 50,000 votes? Or we had a political party get over 100,000 votes and not get a seat. And if it is that those people feel disenfranchised, what has happened in the past 20 years? Those people just leave the system. And only opportunists find their way to the political power elites. We need those minor voices, the people with the real passion for our country to start to have their say in parliament. Some sort of proportional representation, even if it's for the opposition voices only, if they have one senatorial seat for the 10,000 votes or the 3% of the population or whatever it is, what formula you all can come up with, that will start to transform people getting engaged. And you, just to let you know, you're coming close yep. to five minutes. Sure, that's, I think that will address the disenfranchised youth. That will address the young people coming out of university or the people coming out of CXC and not having an idea where they're going, where do they fit in the society, what can I do? When people come out of university in, in, in these developed nations, they, they have some cause that they feel passionate about. They have some thing to invest in for their own benefit in the future. That's why people now go to gangs. That's why people now go to some dead-end job. Because they don't feel like they have any future here and they can't wait to get out. And I, for one, don't. I want to see that changed by this process of constitutional reform. Please, let this be the one that actually brings a change in Trinidad. Thank you. Any other views? Yeah. Good night again to the congregation. Good night to the head table again. The name is Mr. Johnny Musgrave, and there's just one thing I'm going to say, which I really forgot to say. I think the majority of people in Trinidad and Tobago believe in the death penalty. The majority of decent citizens want the death penalty. And if this country is democratic, is this country democratic? Is this country democratic? We need a referendum on the death penalty, as the gentleman say here, very, very good speech. We need a referendum and we need to implement it. Ramesh Lawrence Maraj did it. And that particular month, I'm 64 years of age, that particular month, it hardly had any crime. The saying is, it's not going to change anything. 
That is not the attitude. The problem is, if you kill somebody, cold-blooded, you must die. We're not talking about whether you go change nothing. That's not what it's about. It's about justice. We need some justice in this country. And I am asking everybody to take a paper there who believe in the death penalty tonight. Take a paper and put it inside there. For now is your chance to talk. Because most likely the United Nations, we have a man at the head of the United Nations right now in Trinidad. And he's going to do everything the United Nations says to, to change the laws of this country. And they are going to lay aside the death penalty. So I'm asking every person here that believes in it, take a paper and put it inside. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, before we go on with any further um, contributions from the audience, one of the committee members, Mr. Nizam Mohammed, would like to just address a particular point. Mr. Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to express my deep felt gratitude and thanks to you all for responding to our invitation. I just want to make two comments in relation to two matters that were raised by two of the contributors. That does not mean to say, and I want to emphasize this, every single individual who has spoken in this meeting here tonight, your contribution is so precious. I hope you understand and you appreciate that. The lady representing the Chamber of Commerce, she mentioned about Sangri Grandi, um, perhaps we could have done better. I want to tell you something. I personally felt that we need to go out there and level with the people and get the response from the ground. So I want to tell you we tried our very best and we approached the, this community at different levels, right? And we thought that people who have leadership responsibilities would help us because the thing that really, that really distresses every one of us, you and me and all of us here, is that everything that we try to do to lift this nation of Trinidad and Tobago, we cannot help but see what we are seeing through the lens of partisan politics. This, this attempt, my friend Dr. Farrell says this is our fifth attempt. Nothing came out of the first four starting in 1974-75 and producing the Republican Constitution. The, 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 the Wooding Commission. Until now, we cannot resist seeing things as being national in scope and in perspective. What I would like is to get the help of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. That is why I am in it. I felt this is an opportunity friend in the back there spoke about gangs and my friend here just spoke about the disillusionment of the public in general. We have lost confidence in ourselves. Why has this happened? What can we do, if anything at all, to restore that kind of confidence? I have been in this in my country since the days of 
Dr. Eric Williams, when nationalism was the, the, the thing that was introduced, and that is how we moved to independence. And today, for some strange reasons, we seem not to understand that this attempt that is being made by this committee is a big break for Trinidad and Tobago. I want to be, I want to be very blunt, you know. We see things in different ways and we express ourselves in different ways. I see gangsterism in Trinidad and Tobago as a new political movement that is challenging the status quo of Trinidad and Tobago. And if we do not put the kind of constitution that will provide for us our belief in the, in the creator, belief in our fundamental human rights, belief in family life, belief in freedom of speech, all the freedoms today, and it is not 24, um, 2024, years ago, the Calypsonian told us we are living in jail. And today, how long after the Calypsonian told us that, look at where we have found ourselves. My friends, in spite of it all, I will not give up, and I am asking all of us not to give up. Help us, please help us. You know, you know how you can help us? Come to Rio Claro when we are having our Rio Claro meeting. And let us see whether we can have a grandi Rio Claro coming together. And let us have something, let us have a family get together for the sake of Trinidad and Tobago, man. It is time, and it is time for us to speak up. Mr. Moderator, I'm sorry that I went over my time, but I thought I should make this point. I want to thank each and every one of you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, um, Dr. Farrell has asked if you can get a clarification from one of the presenters. He will identify the presenter. Uh, yeah, I think it's Mr. Musgrave. Um, you said that the Equal Opportunities Commission was not democratic. Could you explain what it is you meant by that? Is it Mr. You're Mr. Musgrave? Yeah, you said the Equal Opportunities Commission was not democratic. Could you explain what you meant? Well, first of all, what I said is that it wasn't democratic in all applications. Clause 7, you have a law like if I am from a certain religion, right? Let's say I'm a Pentecostal and I pass by. I bring it down to how everybody could understand it. So I'm a Pentecostal and I pass by somebody's home who is a Hindu. And I hear them saying, I don't feel that the, that the Pentecostals doing the right thing. Then I could be jailed. I could be caused to pay high sum of money. That is not democratic. That is not freedom of speech. That is not according to the Constitution. The, the, of, it's, it's, it's like the Constitution of Trinidad it's like it contradicting itself there. A, contradiction, a constitution cannot contradict itself. And, and the constitution is above everybody. Religion, president, everybody. This is what we believe in. That's why I said that the constitution, we must legislate that every home must have a constitution. That must be a legislation. Somebody was agreed that for it to be in schools. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Any other views? Who's taking the mic? Who's handing the microphone? Just, just before you uh, proceed further, to answer a question raised by Alderman David, is it? There is provision in the Parliament if a member of the public feels that he has been done by, by a member of parliament. In other words, he may have been maligned or 
what the member may have said is not true. There's provision for you, a member of the public, to write the speaker, pointing out the circumstance. And if the speaker feels it is warranted, she will have your statement read in, in, in the parliament. So there's provision to address that situation. Any other points of view? Yeah, you have here, gentleman here. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is David Guy. I am a resident of San Grande. I am also the councillor of San Grande Northeast. First, I want to apologize for not being able to listen to all the comments. So I don't know if what I'm about to say was said by any member before I was in and out of the meeting. In my humble opinion, crime has been way out of control in our country. Criminals tend to believe that they have the upper hand. It is time we as a country put back the fear in the criminal elements, the fear that they instill in us when they inflict their violence on us as a people. Example, when someone is a victim of gun violence, that person lives with that fear every single day for the rest of their lives. It is time when a criminal is before the courts for gun violence, he feels the fear of God every single day of his life. I am suggesting that the death penalty be placed upon any offender with a gun. Let that individual know that if you put a gun to my head, whether you pull the trigger or not, the penalty is death. To me, that is equal, equal and fair opportunities for the citizens of this country because we as a people are very fearful of criminal elements. However, we have the judicial system who is our protector, who is the one that is responsible for safeguarding our livelihoods. And we're not seeing the judicial system performing in the way that we believe as a people, they should be performed. Offense, ticket offenses went up by 300% and 400%. Let criminal offenses move from six months to 60 years. <clears throat> Only then the criminal elements in this country will know that we are serious about crime. Thank you. Yes, that's good night. Um, it's Tony Torres again. Um, so we have this situation where uh, we have taxi associations sometimes trying to get aid from the enforcers to maintain order and discipline on the stand and to avoid situations that where criminal, criminal activities can become obvious on the stand by way of drivers pulling up each other for cutting the line, uh, passengers trying to bully drivers. Sometimes people come along the way and try to uh, rob drivers on the taxi stand. Now, I think that the, there should be an officer or an, an, a situation where the, the association could engage some authority and express their views about things that happen on, around, on and around the, the route of wherever the taxi is work, working. That would help a lot, alleviate a lot of situations on the taxi stand or en route that should not happen. Um, next situation, next issue uh, about schools. I was, I was having Venezuela, Venezuelans migrate our country so heavily. We should have Spanish being introduced into schools, into, sorry, into primary school or primary school level, rather than the experience I had when I started to go high school and bring a heavy set of foreign language on, on the student. And most students not willing to do that. 
Sometimes students don't see this, the language profitable to learn. So, but if you introduce it at the primary school level, you'll have a lot more children appreciating the fact that learning a foreign language could be fun or even profitable for the future. Schools with a lot of property should not be planting decorative plants, but it should be putting uh, food plants in the schools, and that will help with a lot of poor children who are under poverty because they cannot get the necessary food that is necessary for them to, to live, to live the right way. And I think that's an issue that needs to start now, or not later on. When I was about 13 years old, I um, had a meeting like this in the community where I lived at coal mine. And someone raised the issue that our roads are consistent, consistently de deplorable because of pipelines in the road. And the minister then, but before I was too interested in politics, had said, it will cost too much to get pipelines out of the road. But today I am 48. That is some 35 years or so after we still have pipelines in the road, wasting our resources, trying to fix the road all the time. Sometimes one pothole has to be redug over and over to fix a broken pipeline or a rutted pipeline. And this, this, this is, shouldn't continue. We are wasting a lot of resources throwing into our roads, and the roads are not good. Um, about electing our police commissioner. We have a system that's supposed to elect a police commissioner, and if it involves the opposition, we should not allow, or uh, the one party like the government should not be allowed to elect a police commissioner by passing the system that is in place already to elect a commissioner, which means that having the opposition not having any say is wrong. I think it's wrong, and that should, that should not continue. Because if the opposition has an involvement electing a commissioner, what has happened recently, that means that the, the system has been bypassed. New cameras that have been posted at different stops along our highways and some, some streets. These cameras, are they to catch road offenders or criminals? But we already have different line agencies who are supposed to be enforcers to do this. Now, why would we want more cameras? And we already have, we already have enforcers to enforce the laws or the road traffic laws. Then that means something is not working. And we already have cameras posted at different places that are not working. The camera, are, these, are these cameras supposed to be a deterrent? or they are going to replace the enforcers doing their job? And this is a question that a lot of citizens will ask. Yes, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any more? Yeah, we have a hand at the back there. Once that something positive will come out of this meeting here. So, I thank you for the integrity that you bring. And if we can have men of integrity, when they speak, that they really fall through with the action part of it, I think we can have a lot of change in our nation. Thank you. Well... Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've been at it now for in excess of two hours. Uh, so at this stage, what I would like to do is maybe invite uh, the chairman of the committee to say a few words. Uh, Let me just sit and address you. I would like to sincerely thank all members uh, gathered here this afternoon, this evening, and I want to thank you sincerely for your contribution. Thank you. 
we have some pamphlets which will be given out to you. And in that pamphlet, you will see some words saying it is your constitution, your voice. You are the ones who will influence us to draft terms of reference, to be able to influence the government to listen to you. That's what we are doing here. We're trying to get your views, which we will crystallize into terms of reference. Our objective is to get those views, put them into terms of reference, and more importantly, to have the powers that be listen to you. I think the young man here was talking about that. And the young people, this country is yours today, tomorrow, and young people got to make the difference. There was a young lady in the back there that, that spoke about the youth, and the gentleman spoke about young people not feeling a sense of self in Trinidad. And we do have a measure of brain drain. But at the end of the day, a lot of people will tell you, if we get rid of certain things, for example, like crime, this country is a paradise. I can tell you, I've been to a fair amount of places in the world, and this country is a paradise if we, the people, can get it right. So thank you all for coming. Um, just one thing I'd mention, any of you who wish to make a contribution in writing, you can do so, constitutional reform 2024 at gov.tt. The pamphlet has all the information in it, and please feel free to write to us and uh, express yourselves. At this point, I will ask Mr. Dick, Grantley Dick, to move a vote of thanks.